So last week, <clears throat> we began a, a, a sermon entitled, If Not Now, Then When? If you weren't here last week, I would strongly urge you to go to the YouTube channel and watch the sermon from last week to kind of, this week will make more sense to you. But today is week number two, if not now, then when? The first scripture I want to hit is what we had last week, Acts chapter 1, or Acts chapter 7, verse 1, and the beginning part of verse number 2. It says this, then the high priest asked him, meaning Stephen, are these charges true? Let me stop right there. I'm not sure if I explained that properly last week. If you didn't read Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7, Stephen has been accused of a lot of things, proclaiming Christ and about Christ and talking about Christ, and they felt that he was being uh, uh, an enemy of the, of the synagogue, an enemy of the religious leaders, and he was brought ahead, he brought to the high priest, and he, the high priest says, are these charges too? He didn't hesitate, he didn't wait, he didn't have to think about it. He responded immediately and he said this, to this he replied, brothers and fathers, Listen to me. And we're going to look at what he had to say, but there was no hesitation. There was no time for him to say, well, let me pray about it and give you an answer. The reason why he was able to answer immediately is because Stephen just didn't live a faith of, of a title. He lived faith that was relational. If you ask people all the time, are they Christian? 90% of people are going to say, yes, they're Christian. 90% of them will say, I go to church. If you ask how often, well, you know, I go to church. A lot of people have a name, a title, or they want a name and title, but they don't have the relationship on what really makes that real. We are, without a doubt, living in a time where it's hard, and I touched on this last week, where it's hard to distinguish between the world's values and the values of modern Christianity. Where things are so blended together anymore because of fear of offense, fear of alienation. So we soften a lot of things. Now, don't get me wrong. I talked about it last week and I'm a big believer in this. There's got to be grace. There's got to be understanding. There's got to be time to allow people a process. But overall, what I see happening, and I've been a Christian for 44 years, what I see happening is such a blending of the world's values and the church values together, it's hard to really distinguish which is which anymore. There is a distinction. Only Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Not a single religious leader died on the cross next to him for your sins. Only Jesus Christ. And you can count on the religious leaders being as a symbol of the worldly religions. Jesus Christ is and was the only one to do that. But it's become very, very hard to see the difference in values. I talk to people all the time about, you know, I go in schools. And you know one of the biggest criticisms, criticisms anymore, you know me, and I really don't care because, you know, I'm there for a reason. I am giving too many standards and values to kids. I'm drawing too much of a hard line in the sand. You can't do that with kids. And it doesn't sit well. It puts a lot of pressure on them. No, dimwit. What puts pressure on a kid is when they don't have values. When they don't have standards, when they don't have a mark. I say it all the time. When you get a new Lord, the new, new little bambino, they're fresh out of the chute. They've been, in, they've been baking in the oven for nine months. They've been all wrapped up, stuck between mom's gallbladder, kidney, and, and her ribs. She just, they shove them in there. It's not all nice and contained. Out they come. Now there's freedom. What's the kid do when it gets freedom? It freaks out, man. You see the arms swing out, now they got to stretch. It's like being in a car for eight hours, you know what I'm saying? You know, you got to get out, you got to stretch some stuff. But they just come out and they're like this. You know what makes them feel good? When you get those little blanket things, you wrap those suckers up like cordwood. When you wrap them and you tight them all, oh man, those kids are just like, oh, it's good to be home again. Same way with toddlers. <clears throat> it's the same way with what comes after toddlers. Kids. 
their kids, toddlers, then kid, preschool, and then what? Kids. Elementary, then kids. Where are kids at? Kids just like an overall, so, so, and then, you know, so you work up through the adolescence and you hit the adolescence time. Believe me, young parents, adolescents need a very strong line in the sand. Very strong line for them to have security. But here's the thing, this blending of these two is dangerous. You and I need to stand up for the cause of Christ. We do. If you accept Jesus Christ, you need to stand up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I said this last week, the more you stand for Jesus Christ, as we get closer to his return, the more you will be hated even if you stand full of grace. Even if you say to somebody, I don't hate you. In fact, I love you. I don't accept your behavior. I don't accept your actions. I don't accept what you believe. Even if you say that with a clean heart before God, you are still in this society going to get labeled as someone who hates them. So you know what you do? You stand with more grace. But you still stand. Stephen was this. In verse, uh, chapter 6, verse number 8, it says he was a man full of grace and full of power. In, six, in, in ver chapter 6, verse number 3, it says he was chosen. Now get this. He was chosen to serve the poor and the neglected. You couldn't have a graceless guy there serving the poor and the neglected. One of the greatest missionaries I ever met, his name was Freddie Gonzalez. And Freddie I met, um, it's got to be like 30, 31, 32 years ago, when I was still a youth pastor at Stone Church. And I went down to Mexico to the garbage dumps. Uh, pastor Epperson sent me and another friend of mine, Merrill, down to check out this ministry. And we went down there to the garbage dumps. And in the largest garbage dump in Mexico City, over 3,000 people lived in the dump. They were born there. They were, many of them were criminals. They lived in the garbage dump. The, 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 the dump was five times taller than the ceiling all around us. There was an area maybe, maybe the size of right here that was clean from garbage. And there was a little hut built out of sawed in half 55 gallon drums beaten flat stuck in post and this was the missionaries uh, church this was the missionaries hospital this was the missionary school for the children and Freddie was the missionary at the time he was from New York grew up in Hell's Kitchen was a heroin addict hardcore gang banging tatted up Bad, bad person. And Jesus Christ got a hold of his life. Got a hold of his life. And he went down to Mexico. God called him, didn't know where he's going. Went to Mexico, met the pastor of the local church that has this ministry there. And that he says, I'll go. And Freddie went and worked in that garbage dump. I'd take my young people down there every year. After about four years of being down there, when I saw Freddie, he had got, he was a big dude, big broad-shouldered dude. He was still broad-shouldered, but he was real thin. Actually, Doc went with me on this trip to do a clinic, and when we were down there, I said, Freddie, you okay? Yeah, I've just been losing a lot of weight. I said, yo, Doc, check him out. So Doc checks him out. He says, you know, I'm gonna send you for some blood work. So we get back to Chicago, and I get a call from the pastor of the church down there. And Freddie had AIDS. He got it from Sharon Needles in Hell's Kitchen. Freddie died six months later. What an awesome dude. A man full of compassion and full of grace. And ministered to those kids who had never showered, never will shower, open wounds, sores, lice, you name it, MRSA, staff, you name it, they smell a urine, feces, all over these children. Never once did I see him push a child away. Like I said, he's a big dude. What I would see him was with his arms full of kids, hugging and kissing on him. I'm telling you, be full of grace. 
as Stephen was. He was known for this. Stephen, though, was more than just his job description. This is, what he, this is who he was. Look at your Christianity labels. Many people look at it as a job description. I'm a Christian, so I got to do this stuff. You know, well, how's the old saying go? I'm a Christian, so I don't smoke and drink or chew and hang with those that do. Okay. Um, I don't smoke or drink or chew, but I do hang with those that do. You know why? My Christianity is not a job. It's not a title. It, it's he died for me that made me a Christian. You see? Acts chapter 6, verse number 10. Verse number 9, Jews from all over began to argue with Stephen. This is why he was brought in Acts chapter 7 before the Sanhedrin. This is why he was brought before the court. Jews from all over, all over began to argue with him. They were all coming and they were arguing with him. But in verse number 10, Acts 6, 10, it says this. But they could not stand against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. This right there is actually a fulfillment of of a promise that Jesus Christ made. If you turn in your Bibles, or I think it's up there, it's, you're going to go to the book of Luke, chapter 21, verses 12 through 15. Here at this time, Jesus is saying to the disciples, this is what's going to happen. No, no, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Stephen was not one of the 12. So know this. All right, Luke chapter 12, 21, verse, beginning of verse number 12. But before all of this, they will lay hands on you. They will persecute you. They will deliver you to the synagogue and to the prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors all on account of my name. All right, stop there. Listen to what was just said. Jesus is looking at his disciples and said, this may happen it might happen i think so he was exactly 100 percent telling him the truth this is going to happen but you're saying well of course that's back in in, in, in you know in in 5 b 5 a.d or 10 a.d or whatever 1 a.d this is 2019 of course we've grown so much have we it's like we've grown and then we're slid down again. Because folks, whatever is said in the word is applicable, applicable to today. You go on to read verse number 13. This will result in you being witnesses to them all. Hear that. You're going to be a witness to them. Governors, kings, presidents, Sanhedrin, whatever it is, you will be witnesses. Verse number 14. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. And then verse number 15. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of you, none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. I will give you the words. I will give you the wisdom. It's interesting when you're being challenged in your faith. When I was a youth pastor, I fought pornography in our Palos Heights area. There was a gas station right across the street, a mobile gas station, where they sold pornography. Not behind the counter, it was right there, pornography, just loaded. And it was brought to my, one of my young people brought that to my attention. And I went over there and sure enough, there was like this whole big display case of all this pornography right there. I came back to my office and I started to pray and I said, Lord, what's, what's going to happen? And I felt God tell me to go talk to that business owner and ask him to remove the pornography. So I did. I went over and I said, sir, I'm the youth pastor from across the street. I just want to ask you, would you please remove this pornography? Because Shepherd High School is just a mile down the street. I said, would you move this, remove this pornography from your store? I said, it's very offensive. He told me to get the, out of his store. 
So I got out of his store. And then I went back, and I went back, and I went back. He said, I'm going to call the police for harassment. I said, you need to get this stuff out of your store. Long story short, I felt led that I had to fight that. And I got on my knees before God, and I prayed, and other people prayed. And I sought the Lord. I went, and I, when he wasn't there, and I bought five magazines. And I brought them back, and I looked at them, and I studied them. And you're like, oh, I would have liked that job. But I studied them, and what I found in those magazines was child pornography, advertisements, ch human trafficking, all these different things. I made notes. And I went back to him. I said, his name was Bill. I'm going to ask you one more time. Get this stuff out of here. He said, I'm going to tell you one more time. Get out of my store. I said, I want you to know, I'm going to pray God down on this place. So then I went to the city council meeting, Palos Heights City Council, with a briefcase. Can you imagine me with a briefcase? I had a briefcase. All five. All five. So I went to the city council. None of this is in my notes, so I don't know what I'm talking about. I went to the city council, and uh, there was the mayor and all the city council men and women on the thing. And there was the press that was there because they had heard it already had been... I'd been in front of them before, and the city attorney started giving me all the legal garbage. So it was my turn to speak, and I had prayed. People fasted. Sure, I was praying. And I got up, and I addressed the city council. I popped open my briefcase, and I flipped open pages and turned around and showed the press. And I said, this is what the city of Palos Heights is all about. You thought they were going to jump over the table and tackle me. And I turned around, looked at the city council members. I go, is this what you're all about? I said, I'm going to tell you what. You can either have God's blessing on your life or you can have God's judgment on this place. The choice is yours. The next morning, because I got to get up at three, quarter to three every morning to go pray, I get to the church and there's a park car parked in the back parking lot and turns its lights on when it sees me. Right before I left the house, though, my phone rang. And it was somebody on the phone saying, you better stop now. And when I got to the church, there was a car parked in the parking lot. And I was there alone. And I stood there and I prayed. Whoever is in that car, may they fall on their faces before you. That afternoon, a lady, I went over to the store and I said, Bill, you going to get rid of this pornography? And there's a lady, he's standing talking to this lady. And he had this look on his face. He goes, she would like to talk to you. And here she was the sales rep for the largest distributor of pornography and magazines in the entire Midwest area. And if I'd say the name of this company, I don't know if they still distribute, but they were the largest distributor of all magazines, but pornography making up 80% of their income. And Bill's 80% of his income was from the sale of pornography. She was the rep. So I said, come over to my office. So we sat and talked, and I started showing her these magazines. And she says her husband, she brings them home for her husband. I go, you ever look at this? You see that? That child is six years old. You want, you want your husband? You can buy a child right here for six years old. The woman broke into tears, quit her job. Pastor said, okay, Steve, you guys need to leave. We went on vacation for a week while I'm in Florida. Pastor Jim, the children's pastor, calls me and goes, Trollio, you got to get home. You'll never believe what happened. So we get home, we leave vacation early, we come home. He said, Bill got rid of all the pornography. I went over, Bill saw me, his counter was gone. And he hugged me. And he said, thank you. I go, why are you thanking me? He goes, I woke up in the middle of the night, scared to death. He said, I had to get rid of this pornography. He said, I threw it all away. And I said, because of that, I pray that God will multiply your income by 80%. Sometimes I think, Lord, please let that be you. And you know what? Until the day he sold that business, his profit rose over 80%. Now listen, you will stand and you will be a witness. And I went back to the city council and I shared Christ with them. And I will not back away from it because you will be given power in the name of Jesus Christ. Stephen, you will be a witness. 
here in Luke, he was talking to his disciples and said, you will stand before these people and you will be a witness. Don't worry about what you're going to say. I will give you the words. Hear me. Here is the true purpose and working of God's Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is only one of the gifts of the Spirit. There's, there, there's a whole bunch of gifts of the Spirit, fruits of the Spirit. There's gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, interpretation, healing, tongues, everything. Paul says, I, I speak in tongues more than you all, but the greatest gift is what? Love. The reason why God gives us his Holy Spirit is to make us witnesses, not to stand up and, and just speak in tongues and speak in tongues and speak in tongues or go love on people and love on people and love on people or heal people or be the, the greatest purpose of God's Holy Spirit is to equip you and I to be witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you ask to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. That's why you desire to speak with, for God's words when the Holy Spirit fills you. Stephen wasn't one of the original 12. He was a man who chose Christ. And from what I found, most likely this didn't happen until after Pentecost. In Acts chapter 1, they had gathered, they had waited 50 days. As Christ had told him, there was 120 of them gathered in the upper room. And he says, you wait there for my spirit to come and you will be given what? Power. Power to be my witnesses. And when the Holy Spirit descended on them and it says the tongues of fire split and descended upon each one of their heads. They began to speak in another language. And as they began to speak in another language, guess what? The windows were open. There was a Shriners convention going on right there in the city. People from all over the country were there. All different dialects were there. And guess what? Each and every one of them were hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ in their own native language. It was the greatest Wi-Fi connection ever. Like right now, I could slip into speaking Spanish, but I won't. You know me, I can just slide right into it. But since you all aren't, you know, Espanol like me, I'm going to stick with English. But if Tony was here and some of you maybe were, you know, I'd have Tony do it all in Spanish for you. But, you know, against only one or two of you might go, yeah, maybe. I, uh. But that's what it came. He says, I will give you power to be my witnesses. Power to be my witnesses. So he was a product of the disciples' ministry. Stephen's faith was rooted in the uncompromised teaching of the disciples. He embraced it, he received it, and he lived it. In Acts chapter 7, verse 2 through 50, I don't have that up there. It's an overview of, of really, of, of what Stephen, when Stephen was addressed, are these charges true? Stephen started on this dissertation. You want to know what the Old Testament is all about? Without having to read Numbers and Leviticus and everything else. Just read Acts chapter 7. It'll give you a, like a quick synopsis, like a cliff notes of the entire Old Testament. And he went from, you know, this one to this one to this one to this one. He was building them all up and he just laid it all out. The rulers were so impressed because he delivered the truth. But then... In Acts chapter 7, verse number 51, he looks at them with these and says these words. You know, how, remember what it said in Luke. I will give you the words to speak. Remember Stephen, a man full of grace and of power. Stephen didn't have to rehearse this. He didn't have to look at his note cards. He didn't have to look at a TV prompter. He was standing before the ruling class and he was called to give an account. And baby, he gave an account. He laid it out. And then verse 51, he says, you stiff-necked people. You uncircumcised hearts and uncircumcised ears. You are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. 
Verse number 15, was there ever a prophet your fathers didn't persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. They killed him. He stood there in front of these men who held his life in their hands. And he proclaimed truth. Okay, so was he doing this just to stick the knife in and give it a turn? You know why he said that stuff? To give them the opportunity to let truth set their hearts free. See, sometimes when I or you will have to say something to somebody that you don't agree with, with their belief system, you're going to tell them the truth. Why? Because you want to, st some people will want, and I probably, I know, in my life, I probably wanted to stick not just a knife, but a sword and turn it, stick it, and pull their intestines out. Okay, I might be the only one that has ever felt like that. The rest of you are all better Christians than I. But instead of sticking the knife in and twisting it, why you say it is because you want that truth to set them free. I guess it's, uh, the question begs, are they worth you telling them the truth? Are, you, are they worth you telling them the truth? Somebody I, I talked to this week, known this person a long, long time, and um, she said to me this week, she goes, you know, she said, I, I have a very, I've had a very critical spirit in my life. I go, yes, you have. Because she has. Look up critical, her picture's right there. Now, wait a minute. No, she, she admitted it. I agreed with her. Now, if she asked me, what, do you like my hair? I would have said, do you like it? <laughs> you know, there's a line. But she goes, you know what? God finally broke that in me. I said, well, I look forward to getting to know the new one. Because the old one was, you weren't fun to be around. The truth will set us free. The truth. Stephen, well, let me finish. Now you have betrayed and murdered him, meaning Christ. Verse number 53. You who have received the law that was put into effect, their, their angels, but have not observed it. Stephen was called to give an account. He spoke firmly to those who should have known better. Side note, the church of Jesus Christ is going to be judged a lot harder than the people of the world. Because the church of Jesus Christ should know better. That's just the honest truth. If you're in a church, if you're in this church or another church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, we should know better. We should be the ones filled with compassion and grace and mercy. Instead of like circling the wagons and not letting the dirty people come in. Peeing in the corner to mark our territory to make sure nobody comes in. Because we only want the good people in here. And when we're called upon by God to be, live a holy life or to be, live a life powered by God's Holy Spirit and we reject it, God is going to judge us a lot greater than he's going to judge somebody in the world that knows nothing. He spoke firmly to them. There will come an even greater judgment upon the church if we do not stand up for him. So the question I ask is this. If not now, then when? You don't have to do what I do on Sunday mornings. Not everybody's called to do this. Not, if, I, if I called on one of you to come up here and even just say a word, some of you would have a heart attack. Some of you would just... Your, your, your arteries would constrict, your heart would explode, and you would be dead. D-E-D, -E -D, right on the floor. Why? Because I can't go out in front of people. I get it. This, this, is, this is a different calling. But I want you to know something. This isn't just my calling. This is fun for me. I get to tell people about Jesus. I get to tell people about Jesus at the gym. I get to tell people about Jesus that just came and looked at the property to see about excavation. 
I get to talk to people about Jesus that are in uh, a Vietnam vet that we are standing in Sam's Club with. I get to talk about Jesus. To, I just talk about Jesus to people. You know why? Because God will give me the words. And God can give you the words. Here's the big catch, though. Only if you want it. I don't want to do that. Why would I want to tell people about Jesus? People are not going to like me then. I know people don't like me. I'm not doing a survey here right now. <laughs> but I know there are people that do not like me because, well, there's various reasons. Some have actually done emails to give me reasons. But some have, will, 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 will they, they, some of them is because I tell them about Jesus. And I go, that's okay. My mom didn't like me either. She loved me. Oh, Stephen, I love you. I just don't like you. Okay, mom. And you know what? I can still love people back even if they don't like me. You know why? Because I want to tell them more about Jesus. So you don't have an excuse. We don't have an excuse. If you can open your mouth, you can tell people about Jesus. If you can bake, there's a thought. If you can bake, you can tell people about Jesus. What, I just baked something? I just handed to them? Like baked Jesus cookies? I had a piece of French toast one. I thought it had the face of Jesus. On. No. Somebody's in need, a neighbor just had a baby. You walk over, you hand them a plate of baked goods, and you say, God bless you. That's all you got to do? Yeah, now you can't come to my house. And, well, you could. You could do it like a trial run. <laughs> that we, we, here, look at me. This is class, okay? You can bake something. No nuts. You can bake something. Come to my house, knock on the door, and just, we'll, we'll run through it. It'll be like a role play. I'll be like, oh, hello, do I know you? And you'll go, no, I'm the neighbor down the street. God bless you. Hand me the stuff. You leave then. And I'll, uh, and, uh, you know, and I'll be like, thank you. See, it's good to break the ice like that. We'll practice. Some of you might want to practice a little bit more, but I'm there for you. I'm, we're there for you. Later on in the verse... I gotta hurry because we got communion. Later on in the verse, Jesus was standing next to the right hand of his father. And Stephen was in a pit. As all the religious leaders stood around him with rocks in their hands. And a man by the name of Saul stood there taking the cloaks of the religious leader. Because you can't throw stones if you got a big cloak on. You want to strip down so you can get a good wind up and really clock that individual with a rock because you're going to kill him. And it says that Stephen stood there full of the Holy Ghost and looked up and saw his father, saw Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of his father. And as those men cast those stones and crushed his skull and crushed his vertebrae and crushed his bones and crushed his ribs, and it was a long, lengthy death, painful. It says that Saul stood there, the hater of Christianity, who just a few days later had the Damascus Road experience and came to know Jesus Christ. And his name was no longer Saul, but it became Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Because Stephen stood. Are you ready to stand? Are you ready to be that testimony? I know he wants us to be. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your truth and your word. I thank you for the opportunities that you give us. And I ask, Lord, that you would be with each and every one of us. God, I know there's fear. I know there's apprehension. I know there's unworthiness. I know there's, there, there's shame. I know there's guilt. And there's all kind of stuff in this room that God that would just try to choke out and hinder 
what you've really called for these people to do. I curse it in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, come and touch these lives. Holy Spirit, come and fill these lives. Holy Spirit, equip us to be witnesses of great grace and mercy and power in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord God, that you would help each and everyone here. I pray for those that don't know you, that God, that today will be the day that they surrender their heart to you. Whether they're here or whether they're in our family, whatever it is, God, today will be the day, no matter where they are, we can pray and believe that God, today is the day of their salvation. With your heads bowed for just a moment, I ask this question every week. I'm going to ask you right now. Do any of you want to know Christ as your Lord and Savior? I'm going to ask you to look at me. Do any of you want God's Holy Spirit to fill you with the power that is promised in God's word? I'm going to want you to look at me. No matter what it is, whatever, whichever one doesn't matter, you're going to look at me. On my left, do you want to look at me? Look at me right now. Sure. Got him. Okay. Great. My right. Got him? Sure. Cool. All right. Pray this. Lord Jesus, here I am. You know my heart. You know my need. I ask, Lord, for you to come into my life. And I ask, Lord, for you to fill me with your spirit. I want to follow you. I want a relationship with you. I want to be a witness to others of your grace and mercy. So, Lord Jesus... Here I am. Lord, I thank you for those who prayed that today. Now I ask God that you prepare our hearts for communion. I thank you, Lord, that we can gather around your table in Jesus' name. Amen.